I'm completing the entire mainline Pokemon franchise in chronological order with two challenges ahead of me. The first, we're doing a hardcore Nuzlocke in all 39 mainline Pokemon games released in North America, and the second, no repeat Pokemon may be used. If I choose Rowlet and Sun version, I can't use it in Moon, Ultra Sun, Legends Arceus, nowhere else, period. Same goes for every single Pokemon. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any parts of this series, and since we're making the push to 200k subscribers with your help by the end of 2023. Let's get right into it. So if you haven't already watched the last video on the original Sun and Moon, I'd highly suggest that first, since, you know, this one's gonna be rather connected with it, considering the fact that, well, these are the only other Alola games, and boy howdy, I wish I had some ones between, like Let's Go, so I could have a little bit of relief from Alola. Sun and Moon had a few issues like wonky level caps that would go backwards at a few locations, too many cutscenes that would interrupt the flow of gameplay and make me forget what I'm trying to go do, and a few other issues that aren't pertinent to this series, but I'm hoping Ultra Sun and Moon don't end up being the same. I've only ever completed these games one time, that being an Alolan Sandstrom only run that I did as a race along with Swiggo several years back. So I'm basically going into this set without too much knowledge, but we're gonna see how well this ends up going. Getting straight into it, of course the only starter we haven't chosen yet is Litten, so we're gonna have to go starterless in Ultra Moon. Don't worry though, I've got a great round one encounter lined up for when we get there. Sadly though, because we obtain our starter here in Route 1 in Ultra Sun and Moon rather than in Iki Town like in the originals, we won't be able to get a wild encounter here, but at least we get a great fire and dark type that I'll be EV training in attack and speed. After wiping House Rowlet off of the map and doing the Cosmog and Lily cutscene, there's of course more cutscenes, and the second battle with Hao, going swimmingly as I'm able to solo it with Litten's Ember, but eventually we get to land over in the Trainer School for our first actual encounter in Zerua. Yes, that is indeed the Ultra Necrozma Cheese Machine, and it is ready to ensure our success, but A, we need to make sure it lives to that point, and B, I'm gonna need a fighting type to ensure I bait out Photon Geyser once we get to that point. What fighting type will I be getting? Well, you just have to wait and see. But Zerua will be getting special attack and speed EVs to take advantage of the late game nasty plot sweeping potential thanks to moves like Snarl, Flamethrower, Grass Knot, and Shadow Ball. Sadly, no Dark Pulse since that TM is locked behind the post game, and no Night Days because the level cap of the Elite Four is several levels before Zorwark actually learns it. The school is pretty difficult here though, given we only have two Pokemon and a strict level cap of 12, but I do get a little bit of wiggle room thanks to some EVs on Zorua, and then I'm able to take it down and head into Howley City. Thankfully, we're able to add some real power to the team with our third encounter of the run in Furfru, getting the attack and speed EV treatment. I know, weird to say powerful, but this evolutionless normal type is actually pretty damn strong, though may fall off once we get to mid to late game, though with access to stuff like Stab Headbutt and Return, Charm and Confide, it'll also be great at lowering our opponent's offense to allow for setup sweeps. With our third member though, we're good to take out the Team Skull member before Illima, and his fight is actually a lot easier thanks to having a bulky Pokemon already in tow. By leading with Litten and repeated uses of Growl, I'm able to then swap out into Furfru, set up some sand attacks, then use Work Up a whole bunch to ensure that Tackle is a one-shot on both Young Goose and Smeargold to get past this fight with no worries. After we're clear to enter Route 2 where I grab a Cutie Fly as my encounter, a very solid bug fairy type that actually has speed, a very rare occurrence for an Alolan Pokemon, as well as over in the Howley Cemetery I can get Murkrow during the night. Having a near full team in preparation for the Verdant Cavern trial is going to be super sweet, especially with something as bulky as Furfru to stand up to the Totem Gumshoes. Now that we're in Verdant Cavern, I'm basically able to spam the heck out of Furfru here, getting Headbutt at level 12 and just in time for Gumshoes, who's able to go down in four Headbutts after it and the assisting Young Goose waste time using Scary Face and Leer respectively, taking it down before Furfru even goes to below half HP, so I just Headbutt the Young Goose once to take it out and obtain the Normalium C. If you didn't watch the last video, by the way, just a quick refresher, I don't allow gimmicks in my Nuzlocks. That means no Mega Evolution, no Z-Moves, Dynamax, Terrestrialization, etc. I just think they're too... gimmicky, and to make the games way too easy. But with the Verdant Cavern trial finished, I can encounter wild Pokemon now in here, and obtain my sixth Pokemon in Noibat, being Eevee trained in special attack and speed. Sure, it doesn't evolve until level 48, but it's a speed demon and gets access to a bunch of really good special attacks like Air Slash, Psychic, and Dragon Pulse, so it'll make for a really good addition once we get to that point. Speaking of flying types though, Route 3 is the home of Rufflet, who 
manages to kill my Murkrow while trying to capture it. Well, I guess a flying type for a flying type. It's not like I have a shortage of dark types anyway, so I don't care all that much. That just means I can save Haunchcrow for like, Brilliant Diamond or something, not sure yet. But what I am sure of is my encounter for the Melee Melee Meadows. Unfortunately, can't quite get that yet since the additional Ultra Recon squad fights exist in these games, though a mere match of Furfru was never going in my opponent's favor anyway. Straight after is the third fight with Hao, which is also soloed by Furfru's powerful headbutt. Seriously, this thing is so broken for early game that it's not even funny. As for my encounter, we're getting Cottony. I figured we can get that grass type for the grass fire water core that I love so much, plus more fairy types is always a plus. Not to mention with the man time surfing available in Ultra Sun and Moon, we'll have access to Giga Drain as soon as we hit Akala Island, a great option for specifically Olivia, since the water totem in this game is Araquanid instead of Wishy Washy, so the bug type kinda cancels that out. Of course, this will be Eevee trained in special attack and speed to take advantage of growth and basically outspeeding anything in the game, especially with Prankster for any status options. But with all of those encounters in the bag, it's time for Kahuna Hala. Speaking of Cottony as well though, with the resistance to fighting as well as growth being already accessible, plus Prankster Leech Seed, I'm clear to just set that up on Machop and go to town, getting up to max special attack before Hala gets the chance to really do anything, finally hitting a Mega Drain on the turn he uses Super Potion to get all of my HP back, finishing it off with a super effective Fairy Wind. Second is Makahita who's able to get off a Fake Out before going down to Fairy Wind, leaving just Kerbrawler to fall to the same Fairy Wind fate to win us the battle in the Fight Neum Z. Sweet! And with access to Tauros, we've got our Leftovers access, as well as another encounter in the 10 Carat Hill that I'll be grabbing later because I'm a lazy bum. On to Akala we go, but wait, we do have to surf over there. Yes, with Mantine surfing accessible, we have a lot of options when it comes to move tutors, as well as some berry juice for the early game, a very broken item that heals 20 HP upon going below half, though it will fall off in favor of Leftovers extremely quickly, thanks to Akala giving us access to the TM4 Protect. Melee Melee gives us access to Uproar for Noibat, a pretty strong special move with 90 power, so that's appreciated at this point in the game. Plus now we get vitamins so that we don't have to worry about Eevee training under the level cap with any future encounters. Akala Island also has the move tutor for Giga Drain, so we've already gotten our best grass type move for Cottony pretty much instantly. Now that grind's done, on to Akala itself. So of course we have to fight Dexio before getting out onto Route 4, an easy fight handled by Furfru, as are basically all basic fights for now, though it is unfortunate that we don't get to battle <laughs> Really though, there's no reason not to use Furfru, although how is an exception since our newly evolved Toracat handles Dartrix, and Cottony walls out Pikachu with Leech Seed and Growth, so we can sweep up the rest of his team in Noibat with Fairy Wind and Eevee with Giga Drain without any sweat off our brow. Not grabbing any encounters yet though, just charging straight into Route 5 for our first battle against Gladian, who's easily swept with Headbutt Spam from Furfru again. KOing Zoo, excuse me, Zorua, Zubat, and Type Null made easier thanks to some flinching. Though looking back on it, it was totally doable even if I didn't get a single flinch. But now that we have access to the Water Trial, I figured we'd get one more encounter back on Route 4 in Mudbray. It's not quite useful yet, but certainly will be with Kiawe's Trial coming up shortly. I'll be EV training this in Max Attack, as well as a split in Defense and Special Defense, since there's no way I'm wasting speed EVs in a Pokémon whose evolved form has a base 35 speed. See what I mean about Alolan Pokémon having poop for speed? As for Araquanid in the Water Trial though, this is actually a bit easier than expected thanks to, you guessed it, Furfru. Not exactly a solo fight though, but Headbutt easily rips through half of his HP before it and the assisting Dewpider lower my speed with Bubble, bringing us below half HP and into KO territory, assuming they do the same thing next turn. So that allows me for an easy pivot into Cottony to bait some bug type moves after taking some water moves, then into Rufflet to take those four resisted damage. From here, it's just two sets of Protect and Wing Attack to KO Araquanid, although we are risking losing Rufflet here due to the immense damage laid out by both of them. And sure enough, despite Dewpider using Spiderweb last turn, it does go for Bubble this turn and KOs after the Araquanid goes down, KOing a Rufflet and forcing us to finish the fight out with Noibat, using two gusts to KO and win the day. Unfortunately, we're not going to see Braviary for this run, but that's also fine since now we can save it for Legends Arceus, so I can't see either that or Murkrow were bad trades. What is a bad trade is the way I handled this fight against Dulce in the Paniola Ranch. That was not a good segue, but that's okay because 
wow, this thing has really high stats for this point in the game, and it basically takes my entire team to take it down. Though admittedly, this was made much harder due to Dulce's usage of X defense and healing items, but I didn't lose a single Pokemon here, so no need to worry. But you might be wondering, why is Mudbray not on the team for this one? I don't know. Probably because I didn't realize this fight was here. Anyway, moving on ahead through Route 6 and the Battle Royale Dome, where we dome Kukui's Rock Ruff with Giga Drain, ending it straight away, it's time for Wella Volcano Park and the Fire Trial. Now before we can go in there though, I need to head back to grab two new encounters. The first is back in 10 Carat Hill with Carbink. Now recall that I never ended up using this in battle during the Sun and Moon video, so it's ripe for the picking since I think it'll be our best screen setting option for this game. The second is Dewpider back on Brooklet Hill, and while that bug typing might make us neutral to fire attacks, the defenses this guy provides, as well as a key move much, much later on in the game, assuming we can hold on to it for that long, will prove to pay dividends. I'll let you guess on that until we get to that point, but let's see how this Totem Marowak fares against our team. Unfortunately, there's no healing between fights, so our lead Carbink is in really bad shape here. But thanks to a quick pivot into Araquanid before the assisting Salazzle comes out, we're able to take out most of Marowak's HP with two quick bubble beams. But Araquanid's gonna be out of the count for the rest of this fight because of it. I'm contemplating a sack here so that it can get into Mud Break cleanly and just clean up the fight with Bulldoze, though I think I have a better plan. I'm gonna go into Furfru, take a Leer and Venishok for barely any damage, use Protect to get back some of the HP, then use Bite on Marowak since it's super effective and try to get the KO. But of course, it's a range, and I happen to miss that range because ranges are the bane of my existence. However, I do still have a turn to do something here, and it can lead into the sack I mentioned before, using Bite one more time after a Protect to get the KO, Taking Flame Burst from Salazzle, uh, only to survive on 3 HP. Furfru is the best doggo ever, though admittedly I would never own a poodle in real life because I don't like those breeds of dogs. I much prefer Shiba Inus, literally the perfect little pups. Dog friends aside though, I'm able to protect one more time, swap into Toracat to take the Flame Burst with resistance, protect against Venishok, then swap into Mudbray to resist the incoming Venishok before walloping this thing with a one-shot Bulldoze to win the fight with zero losses. Well, that was a bit risky, but I can't complain. All of my Pokémon survived, and I did what I could with the options I have at my disposal. Speaking of options, though, I'm not sure how well I'm going to do against the Totem Lorantis in the Lush Jungle. I mean, I have quite a few things that are super effective against it, but with an assisting comb fee that's able to heal it with flower healing every turn as well as set up Sunny Day, I'm going to be in for a world of hurt. I can't really resist its attacks with Cottony since it has X Scissor, which is super effective. Furfru isn't going to work out too well because this Lorantis has low sweep for coverage, and Solar Blade is a death sentence to basically anything due to the high physical attack, plus stab, plus 125 power, plus L, plus ratio, plus I'm white. So we're in for a doozy here, folks. Starting out here, I'm going with Cutie Fly, as I know Signal Beam is close to half damage, and it probably is as close as I can get without making the assisting Pokemon called Not Be Comfy, as there's also a Kecleon that Lurantis can call if it drops below half HP on the first turn, and that has Ancient Power and Screech. No thank you, sir. I would not like to die this late into the series. Instead, what I'm trying to do is get Lurantis confused with Signal Beam, and hopefully just cheese a win on a turn where it goes for synthesis or just hits itself. It doesn't really matter because I would kill it pretty much instantly after that because it has the high attack stat and would do pretty good damage to itself. But that seems to be a no-go. Despite this being a pretty good strategy to get rid of the five power points of synthesis, it doesn't get the confusion during this time, and I still have to contend with floral healing. There's also the problem of flower shield in case Cutie Fly can't get the job done, and that's raising our physical defense like mad on turns where Comfy doesn't need to use floral healing. However, spamming Signal Beam is still the best plan I've got, so I just keep going for it and alternating with Protect whenever I expect a usage of Solar Blade, which happens to work out during the off time of Sunny Day since I get to waste her Power Herb. Great stuff, but those synthesis power points plus floral healing are just outdoing my damage output. I'm still at around two thirds HP though, so I just keep pushing for the attacks, alternating Protect and Signal Beam to hopefully keep up my HP for as much as possible, and somehow managing to land on Lorantis during a non Sunny Day turn so that Solar Blade whiffs wall while not taking damage. Though admittedly, I'm getting a bit worried since I'm 11 points of 15 deep into Signal Beam and I still haven't gotten the confusion once, and I'm also still at around two thirds HP. However, the tides finally turn when Comfy either makes a mistake or runs out of floral healing. I wasn't really keeping track of those power points on that one, but it goes for Flower Shield on a turn that Lorantis can't synthesis due to not having the points anymore, allowing for the sun to run out on the turn I use Protect, forcing Sunny Day from Comfy and giving me more than enough HP necessary to survive a critical if needed, hitting a 12th and final signal beam to put this Mantis out of its freaking misery. 
All that's left is Comfy, and thankfully the only attacking move it has is Magical Leaf, which Cutie Fly has resisted the few times it actually has gone for it, but to be completely safe, I decide to use Struggle Bug and Protect, then adjust to Draining Kiss once I'm feeling safe enough to do so. Ending the fight on full HP, as it goes down, and I get the Grassium Z. Gotta say, I do like this totem fight. It's one of my favorites, and the power orb really gets you strategically thinking of when you fire protect, and whether it's worth using during Sunny Day just to outlast it. But with no losses here too, all that remains are the fights against Plumeria and Olivia on this island. Though at least my reward for getting past the level 24 cap of Lurantis is Rabombi, evolving at 25 and giving me access to the significantly superior Pollen Puff. Admittedly though, I wouldn't have used this against Lurantis because of the Kecleon threat, but I digress. Moving ahead through Diglett Tunnel and into Connie Connie City, I do make sure to grab the Cover Fossil just in case I need to use a Tortuga later, since I haven't used one yet in this series, and I don't think there are any other games where I can? I'll have to double check, but it might just be a use it or lose it scenario here. Anyway, those two fights start with Plumeria, which is easily handled thanks to Carbank. Theoretically. I thought I could just slap a Person Berry on it and slap Golbat with two Smackdowns to KO it, but sadly, it doesn't do enough damage. Thankfully though, Confusion can't really do much damage to Carbink because of that lack of attack stat, so I can just sit here and just keep clicking the attack button until Golbat goes down, using three of them before it KOs and Salandit enters second, who then goes down to two more after poisoning Carbink. Of course, Olivia is going to be a little bit more difficult, but it shouldn't be too bad since those rock types are pretty brittle against Cottony but I don't know if I have to use it. She starts with Anorith, so we're gonna need to work it down a bit. Firstly, I'm gonna try to tackle this with Furfru. Well, not with Tackle, but you get it. We've got Bite and Work Up, as well as Protect Leftover Strats, so I'm gonna see if I can just work through the party here. But Bug Bite does end up doing quite a bit of damage, so I'm only able to set up four of them before Bite KOs in one shot, leading to Lilip. Now I can protect and use Bite again here, but that only does half and Lilith's able to heal back up with Giga Drain, so it'll take three Bites to KO. All good though, since clearly we're not going to be able to protect against the upcoming Rock Z move, so after KOing the Lilip and Lycanroc enters, I just swap to Carbink on Continental Crush, taking a little over half as Protect gives me a little bit more HP, taking a Bite next turn as Reflect is set up, allowing me to safely swap into Mudbray to get the job done with high horsepower. Turns out that's all I needed because apparently one one of them was enough to KO. Maybe I should have just kicked off with that strat, but alas, we get the Rock Neum Z and finish out our trials here on Urkala Island, though we do have to take a quick detour over to the Aether Paradise to deal with the Tentacle Hentai Monster, also with high horsepower. Guess there's no cock like horsecock, even in comparison to tentacles. I'm gonna blame that joke entirely on Asagi Ame, because she introduced me to that Pepper Coyote song. It is your fault. Speaking of which, go check out our Soul Link videos that we did over on her channel. With all that done, we're finally on Ula Ula Island, and thankfully, how does it immediately throw us into a battle upon landing unlike Sun and Moon? I can go into the Pokemon Center, change my party around, and make it ready to fight him. Admittedly though, it's not like we need to change much, since we're just doing what we need to do with Toracat, taking out Dartrix with a mix of Fire Fang and Leech Life, though of course the latter ends up missing the range and I take more damage than what I recovered, but that's about par for the course at this point. Once Dartrix is taken out, out comes Vaporeon, so I just Protect and swap for Cottony, using Protect then Growth to start my setup sweep, but I can only get one off before Water Pulse starts doing too much damage, so I go for Giga Drain for massive damage to heal all that back up, shifting back into another Growth next turn. Oddly enough though, How swaps for Noibat expecting another Giga Drain, so that's a free boost. Then I can Fairy Wind at plus 3 to KO as he sends in Alolan Raichu, who I have the perfect strat for. He goes for Psychic, so I swap for my Zoroark disguised as Mudsdale. This is the same trick that's used to bypass Ultra Necrozma with ease, but here instead I can force it out of using Thunderbolt and only using Psychic, throwing off the AI to use the move that it thinks would be the most effective and do the most damage when it actually does nothing, and allows for the one-shot. KO with Night Slash as Tauros enters next. Despite Intimidate though, I can just shift to using Foul Play here, doing over half as Horn Attack does a little less than half to Zorwark, destroying the illusion but going down before it has a chance of capitalizing on it, leaving just the damage Vaporeon to go down to Cottony's Giga Drain following Protect and swapping for it. And that's how easily done. Gotta love Zorwark actually coming in clutch for some fun strategies already, and that's probably not the last time we'll be doing that to How, assuming we can keep both Mudsdale and Zorwark alive. There's really not much inhibiting me from going from that fight over to Mount Hokulani for the Totem Togemaru, so we take out some Skull Grunts and head right up on in there. No Molane fight with a higher level than the current cap required. 
Thank you, game designers, for finally coming to your senses. Although they do this mistake in the late game when we have to take a level 55 Totem Rabambi down, and then immediately after a level 54 cap fight against Hapu, but hey, it's only a single level and can be worked around. Anyway, oh look, Mudsdale just one-shot the Totem with high horsepower. Shocking! However, the next totem will not be so easy. The one that they didn't end up changing out was Mimikyu. No surprise on that front, since it's super difficult and probably the best ghost type in the game, but I should have a solution here to ensure victory with zero casualties. Beforehand, though, we have to fight Guzma back in the Mali Garden, and he's pretty simple to take down. Just protect against Galissapod's first impression using Furfru, then set up five workups on his power points of Sucker Punch, then use Furfru's Headbutt to knock it below half, swap it into Masquerade, KO that with Headbutt through Intimidate, because we're still at plus four, protect against the second potential use of first impression, and attack for game. Very intelligent moves, but what wasn't intelligent was accidentally fighting this black belt that's totally optional. See, I was just clicking through and following the speedrun route of this game, and I totally didn't just forget to press down and get out without fighting this Beware, but Beware is right because Mudsdale nearly dies during this, but manages to pull through and gives us the win in the end and gives me access to a TM that I don't need. Great! Well, at least that opens up Route 12 and therefore Blush Mountain, housing a Sunstone that I'll be able to use on Cottony shortly. Before I do, though, it's time for that Totem Mimikyu that we all love to hate. Unfortunately, I don't really have much in terms of super effective options, plus I don't have much that can stand up to physical attacks too well. However, I think I'm going to go at it with Incineroar, Whimsicott, Carbink, Mudsdale, Furfru, and Araquanid. With the normal type immunity with Furfru and access to Heavy Slam with Mudsdale courtesy of level 34, I should be fine to handle this bastard. U-Turn's also great for knocking off the disguise, so first things first, I'm leading Whimsicott so I have access to Charm with Prankster, ensuring that I move before Mimikyu has the chance to attack and lower its threat level considerably. With that, I'm able to do that twice more despite the assisting Bayonet hitting the field, finally ending on U-Turn to knock Mimikyu's disguise out and swap for Mudsdale, who's unfortunately hit with Curse as soon as we bring it in. However, after taking a quarter, we just swap for Furfru on some Ghost-type attacks, so we should be fine. They do barely any damage on switches, so I use U-Turn once more to go back into Mudsdale, taking a faint attack from Bayonet before going for Heavy Slam. But of course, Bayonet just has to go for Will-O-Wisp and hit the 85% accuracy to have my attack stat, ensuring that I can't KO with two Heavy Slams. That's fine though, as we do get some major damage on it regardless before swapping into a Raquinid, taking the two attacks very easily before going for Leech Life on Mimikyu, and then alternating with Protect to keep our HP up. But that is not really doing that much damage, so I opt to swap for Incineroar, but that turn Bayonet goes for Curse, KOing itself and doing 25% damage to Incineroar as Mimikyu calls for more help and brings in Jellicent. Uh, just great, uh, there is no shot I managed to survive that with Incineroar, and I sure as hell didn't count on this thing making an appearance. Thankfully, Araquanid's still relatively healthy so I can swap it back in, then alternate back and forth between Protect and Bite for a few turns, whittling slowly but surely away at Mimikyu's HP before finally swapping Furfru in on some Ghost-type attacks, KOing Mimikyu with Bite, and Jellicent with two more to win the fight. Not the best laid out plans, but it was the best laid out team that I could have given it. And I feel like I played that ending bit by ear pretty well considering I did not build this team whatsoever to counter Jellicent. With the Ghost Neum Zia in hand though, I'm ready to head back to the Aether House for another fight against Plumeria, who should be easy enough to handle at this point with my fully evolved team. Golbat though is still a bit of a pain to take care of with Carbink, though at least it doesn't have Confuse Ray this time. It does have Poison Fang though, and I know this stupid thing's obsession with getting Toxic Poison on literally every single use of the move. Carbink's able to handle it for a while, barely not taking it down before the poison damage becomes too much, because of course it gets the poison almost immediately. So I swap for Mudsdale, and what do you know? It's a f***ing Toxic Poison on the first turn Mudsdale's in. Die, you pain in my ass. Same goes for you, Salazzle. God, what an annoying fight. Even in Ultra Sun and Moon, she has the tendency to literally have godlike poison luck. But with her out of the picture, I can head into Po Town to rescue that child's young goose by beating up Guzma physically. Speaking of which, this Rock Slide TM here should do wonders on these annoying bug types of his. So of course, I'm going straight in on Galissapod here, expecting to do the same thing I did in the earlier fight, and that's protect the first impression with Furfru, get three charms off now that I've learned it for some added protection, then use six workups to kill the entire team with Headbutt. By the looks of it, Furfru staying at basically full HP despite the defense drops from Razor Shell, getting up to plus six attack as Razor Shell misses and allows Furfru to get to full HP. 
Then we spam the heck out of Headbutt to bring Galissapod down below half HP, swapping him into Pinsir, then headbutting that twice, KOing, then once to Masquerain, also KOing, only to finally falter at the end when I forget to use Protect again on Galissapod, being hit by a nasty powerful first impression for around 80% of Furfru's HP. Uh, it doesn't matter as Headbutt KOs and wins me the fight. All that's left for Ula Ula Island, though, are the fights against Gladian and Nanu, so let's get a move on. Gladian's back in the Aether House leading Golbat as I lead Incineroar, hitting a Darkest Lariat for well over half after taking an Acrobatics, then using Protect and doing the same thing next turn to get back to around half HP once Type Null is sent out. However, I don't really think having a half HP Incineroar out right now is the wisest decision considering this thing has Crush Claw, so I swap into a Raquinid and go for Leech Life, one-shotting it to reveal that it is indeed the Zorwark, healing to full and going against the actual Type Null by trading Leech Life and Protects for his uses of Crush Claw, healing off most of the damage thrown at me and eventually winning the fight at a little under half HP. Good stuff, but is Nanu more difficult? Well, being a Dark-type user, not really. We have so many good options for these at this point in the game that it's not even funny. Healing's off with Sableye as I go with Whimsicott, immediately protecting against Fake Out, then going for Growth. I should be able to get at least two of these off and Giga Drain to KO it afterwards, maybe even three if I'm lucky. And sure enough, I do manage to get three of them off before being brought to just 11 HP, using Protect and Giga Drain to heal to just about 80% of my HP as Persian comes in second. Now, I don't think Persian's gonna go for Black Hole Eclipse, instead opting for Power Gem as I swap out into Incineroar. Then it does the same thing as I swap out into Mudsdale, finally using Protect against the Z-Move and firing back with two high horsepowers to get him into healing range. This is perfect though, as now I can cleanly swap into Rabombi, take a Power Gem for around 80% damage, then fire back with Pollen Puff to KO. All that remains is Krokorok, and Araquanid is the perfect wall for this. The only problem here is Swagger, but thankfully we roll positively on the first turn of Confusion hitting Krokorok with a plus two leech life to KO with super effective damage to win the day. But with that, we're done with Ula Ula, but not quite over to Pawnee Island yet, as there's still the Aether Paradise and the fights against Guzma and Lusamine to handle. Guzma has now added his fourth and final team member here as I start Whimsicott against Galissapod, which might seem strange, but it's actually my best option since while weak to first impression, a simple protect is able to bypass this, then I can resist the razor shells that it does as I use Charm three times before swapping for Araquanid to set up Reflect. This then further gives me protection as I can finally end on Furfru to set up Work Up six times uninterrupted, getting back to full HP before delivering a plus six headbutt to Galissapod to send it packing with emergency eggs it into Pinsir. Headbutt KOs Pinsir, as does Masquerine following Intimidate, leaving Galissapod to come back in, be protected so that it never hits first impression, then gets KO'd by Headbutt to leave just Vicavolt. However, I do make a little bit of a mistake here. Headbutt doesn't actually get the one shot at plus five, though that's probably because of the Intimidate drop that I should have recovered on with Galissapod, should have used Protect, Work Up, Protect, and then Headbutt to get back to plus six and ensure that I one shot this thing. But minor's mistakes don't matter when you can just flinch with headbutt and KO with the second one to win the day. Admittedly though, I probably should have just grabbed the return TM as soon as I was done with Nanu's fight when it was made available. Anyway, Lusamine should not be too bad either considering Clefable's still not that threatening of a Pokemon as a lead. Though of course Dulce ends up being an annoying jackass with that Poipole again beforehand, but hey, it doesn't end up taking out any of my party, so who am I to care? Anyway, Lusamine leads with the aforementioned Clefable as I go with Araquanid, immediately going for Confide as she wastes time with Charm, but she gets pretty savvy to the idea after a single turn, shifting to using Hyper Voice on my non-Protect turns, all while burning her points of Moonblast and Psychic on the Protects. Overall though, it doesn't end up mattering as I'm able to get all six Confides up with nearly full HP, only eight points below max as I swap for Furfru, taking a Hyper Voice, then what do you know, it's time for Workup Strats. So much for Furfru falling off mid to late game, this thing is still a clean sweeper. Though admittedly I should have again grabbed return before heading in here. Six workups alternating with protect is all it takes for me to get to the max, blasting out a one shot headbutt on Clefable to KO since for some ungodly reason, she did not decide to go for charm that entire time. I figured that I would have been sitting here using all of my power points of workup, but hey, I'll take it. Psyching out is Beware, who only takes half from Headbutt, but it does flinch, so maybe this is the better choice after all. But then Ranges rear their ungodly heads once again, as I barely miss the KO with the second one, being nailed by a Drain Punch that nearly KOs Furfru, but only recovers about a quarter for Beware, so it goes down two turns later with a Headbutt, since Protect is God's Nectar in these challenges. 
Third is Liligan, so I just alternate Protect and Headbutt once more, KOing and leading to Milotic, who falls to the same alternating fate. All that remains is Low Punny, and we're able to kill the Kubermon after protecting and taking a Thunder Bunch for minimal damage. Better start rebranding this place Headbutt Paradise, because that's basically how this entire thing went. After Lusamine makes the Portal 3 Valve never will, it's time to finally head off to Pawnee Island for the last bit of the game. Now that we're here though, we're going immediately back to a few areas because we need new encounters. I'm very close to the level cap for Komoo, literally only a level behind and I don't want any of my team members to accidentally overlevel for that fight, so I figured I'd grab a few things. First things first, Kangaskhan over in the Wella Volcano Park. Now I'm sure you're wondering why a Kanto Pokemon, and it's only because it's available in Rock Tunnel and nowhere else in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. However, the encounters that are also available there that I haven't used are far more frequent to pop up and serve us better in the long term anyway. But at least here I can just sit in an SOS chain with Cubone until one pops out and finally capture it. Secondly, Comfy in Lush Jungle, third, Tortuga on Route 8 after reviving the Cover Fossil, fourth, Minchino in Mali City's Outer Cape, thankfully bundled with a shiny stone from inside the city, and finally, Beldum from Mount Hokulani. Yes, despite the fact that we got Beldum in the last video and used both it and Matang, we never made it to Metagross, and by god with the power of the EXP share, we are making it there today. Although that's not it, there's actually one more on Route 13, as I fish up a Bruxish, since after all, why do we need another water psychic fish when Gen 9's already going to provide us with Veluza? Well, I guess if we do not use it, we could save one for Scarlet, one for Violet, but we'll see. Last thing, Noibat finally evolves into Noivern after grabbing the Sun Flute on Executor Island, going into the Vaspani Canyon for the gauntlet of required trainers in there with a fully functioning Dragon type, although still without a Dragon type move. But hey, Stab, Air Slash, and Psychic as coverage still do a pretty good job at this point in time. Speaking of which, Dulce is still trying to block our path with that Poi Pole of his, but Mudsdale makes quick work of it as it's now been outclassed by our fully evolved Pokemon. Once I finished up through this gauntlet though, I realized that wow, I didn't need to actually capture any of those things since I managed to fit under the level cap the whole time. But that Komoo is still really strong and I need to ensure I survive this fight and it's not as nearly as easy as it was in Sun and Moon. The partner Pokemon is no longer 14 levels below the actual totem, or 13, I think it was 13, it was 45 and 32, I don't remember. But instead here lies a similarly leveled Noivern, a big counter to my Whimsicott, so there's no way I'm bringing that into this fight despite being a fairy type. Instead, I'm leading with Mudsdale against Komoo, having taught it Toxic over Iron Head since Komoo doesn't really have a way to heal off this poison either with its held item or with anything like Refresh. So then I can just alternate Protect to do some damage, then use it again on Noivern after taking a second Dragon Claw and a Screech. So now both of them have been afflicted, and with just about all of my Pokemon having Protect, I should be completely fine. One more Protect before swapping out takes Komoo down to below half, then I can swap into Rabombi to take Komoo's Dragon Claw, then taking Noivern's Boom Burst for less than half damage, using Protect afterwards to outlast Komoo, and bring Noivern to below half. From there, it's a simple swap into Furfru, taking Air Slash for less than half, then protecting one more time to KO and win the fight. Not gonna lie, this is pretty cheesy, and I don't really like it that much, but if it makes things more consistent and easier, maybe I can take advantage of that more in Ultra Moon before we finally finish off the Alola games. With this penultimate totem Pokemon defeated though, we're quickly approaching this Necrozma fight. And one thing you may have noticed is a distinct lack of fighting types, as I alluded to at the beginning of this video. But this is where the last Kalos starter comes in. That's right, the reason we did not choose Chesspin in X or Y is because it's available on Executor Island as an island scan encounter in Ultra Sun and Moon. Now that is what I call efficiency. With a grass fighting type on the team, I now have a way to successfully bait Photon Geyser, as well as Zoroark still alive and ready to toxic stall this thing out of existence. However, we still need to take care of Dustmane Necrozma first. Sadly, we can't toxic stall this one due to being part steel type, so we're gonna have to just go on an all-out offensive. Thankfully, this is easily done with Incineroar, and is the main reason I reserved Litten for Ultra Sun rather than burning it in either Sun or Moon. All this thing has is Sun Steel Strike, Morning Sun, Psycho Cut, and Night Slash. One move that we're completely immune to, two moves that we resist, all with Morning Sun that only has five power points and can be easily burned through with super effective moves like Darkest Lariat and Fire Punch. 
So that's that. Less than half damage to Incineroar, and the Legendary has been taken down with just a few Darkest Lariats. But that's just the first phase. Once we make it into the Ultra Megalopolis, we're ready to take on Ultra Necrozma at a whopping level 60. Zoroark up front with Toxic, Chestnut in the back slot as the illusion target, and this fight is as good as over before it began. Turn 1 we Toxic after being immune to Photon Geyser, and since the AI doesn't understand what's going on, it just goes for the move three more times, all while I use three Night Slashes, KOing before it runs out of power points to win back the Light of Alola, as well as a Poi Pull from the Ultra Recon Squad. While I do appreciate it, I don't think I'll be using this one in this game. I have enough special attackers to be satisfied for the Elite Four, considering that we wouldn't be able to give Poi Pole Dragon Pulse until we hit the top of Mount Monokila, as that's where the move relearner is. But with the story basically wrapped up, we've got one more totem Pokemon to take down, and that's Rabombi. However, Mina's Trial does involve quite a few fights in it against her, Elima, Mallow, Kiawe, and Sophocles in Ultra Sun version, or inversely, Lana and Nanu as replacements for Mallow and Sophocles in Ultra Moon. Though admittedly, I'm not sure I'm thrilled about the shape of the objects that I'm receiving to indicate my success in the trial. I mean, this is just a butt plug. This is just a tail toy that also doubles as a butt plug. That is a butt plug for more experienced users. That's just a dildo. And finally, the sex train stops at the station with the red pedal finally looking like a goddamn pedal. Though, sadly, during the fight with Kiawe, we did have to sacrifice Chestnut since our team was getting slaughtered at this point, and we still had to fight the hiker afterwards. But thankfully, we came out with only that single death. Admittedly, I only caught Chestnut for the Ultra Necrozma strategy, so he did more than he needed to, so thank you, Joey Chestnut. Anyway, the yellow one looks like a piece of candy corn, so at least that's kind of funny considering it's the one that we get from the fat kid, and then DAMN IT! We're back to the butt plugs with Nanu giving us Ace Roll as Purple Petal. This had to have been intentional. There's no shot that this wasn't done exclusively to give adult fans of Pokemon something to point and laugh at, all while the kids were none the wiser. Or were and had to hold their laughter in around their parents. Admittedly though, I'm surprised that they all fit together into a cohesive flower that actually looks nice from the art asset provided here. But I digress, it's time for a Rabombi. This thing is scary as all get out, considering it starts with all stats at plus two before the battle begins. But here's where that key move from Araquanid that I mentioned earlier comes into clutch. It learned Mirror Coat at level 50, meaning we're just gonna kill this thing as soon as it goes for a special attack due to those boosts. However, I did get really scared since she goes for not one, not two, but three Quiver Dances, all while the assisting Pelipper sets up two stockpiles. Thankfully though, Pelipper wastes its third turn on a third stockpile, all while we survive a plus five bug buzz from Rabombi on around 20 HP, firing back with a mirror coat to KO and live to fight another day as Pelipper is the only other threat. I swapped a Metagross to resist the spit up, eventually just firing back with several Zen headbutts to KO and win the fight, lowering our cap from level 55 to 54, so we're not gonna be able to use Metagross or Carbink for our fight against Tapu. Not that we were gonna do that anyway. She is now over on Executor Island, leading Golurk as I choose Araquanid, immediately setting up Reflect after taking a Shadow Punch, only to swap to Furfru as she goes for Stealth Rocks instead of the predicted Shadow Punch. All good though is despite her having access to Hammer Arm with the power of Reflect and three charms, this does not matter in the slightest as I can now swap back to Araquanid, surviving the damage from the Stealth Rocks, and then just wait this out with Protect and Leech Life to get it back to full HP, just in case I need to bring it in later. Though admittedly this does go almost downhill when Golurk gets a critical Shadow Punch that puts Araquanid into the red. Not a problem though, is just as long as we don't get hit with another one, we should outheal the damage easily with repeated uses of Protect for Leftovers Recovery and Leech Life to gain back more HP. Finally, ending on Whimsicott so that we can set up 6 growths and do a super effective sweep. I did have to let go of Protect for this one though, due to wanting to retain the slot for Charm just in case, all while keeping growth for the stat boosting, then Giga Drain and Moonblast for our super effective options considering there's a Flygon on Hapu's team. Once at plus four though, I figured this was more than enough to KO this entire team, taking out Golurk with Giga Drain, Mudsdale with the same, Gastrodon with the Trifecta, and finally Flygon with Moonblast to win the day. And now, all that remains is the fight against Gladian at the base of Mount Lanakila and the Elite Four and Champion title defense. Half a dozen battles, and we have an immense number of options for party members. 
Gladian leads Crobat as I go with Metagross, taking acrobatics for minimal damage as Zen Headbutt fires back with a one-shot KO, bringing in Lucario, who actually reveals that it's Zoroark after I use Protect. Oddly enough, as Z-moves do trigger the illusion to go away. Thankfully, we went for Protect though, just in case that happened, making Black Hole Eclipse do just over half as I swap to Incineroar to swiftly take this illusionist out with a Brick Break following a Hyper Voice for massive damage. The actual Lucario is in third, and there's no way I outspeed and survive an Aura Sphere, so I decide to protect for the recovery and swap for Araquanid, taking the Aura Sphere in the process and just beginning to go on an alternating Scald and Protect routine until it manages to go down, taking three rotations, all while he keeps blasting Aura Sphere like there's no tomorrow, leaving just Silvali. This is a Water-type Silvali due to the held Water memory, so Araquanid's actually going to be able to hold its own very effectively here, walling up both against that and X-Scissor while setting up Reflect, taking minimal damage from Crunch, all while doing alternating Protect and Leech Life strats to keep healthy. This eventually leads to the KO of Silvali, winning me the last important fight before the League. One trip through Victory Road late- oh, hi Necrozma, bye, bye Necrozma, um... It's time for preparation. I went around the region to grab several TMs and potential held items for these fights, and I think with Mudsdale, Zoroark, Carbink, Metagross, Incineroar, and Furfru, we should be able to pull through. So much for half a dozen of those captures earlier aside from Beldum, but here we are. First up in the league is Molane, starting off with Klefki as I go with Mudsdale, or should I say Zoroark. See, I'm doing this entirely to make sure that the opponent never goes for Thunder Wave, as Klefki has Prankster and would outspeed Zoroark, nullifying my ability to Nasty Plot Suite if I did. However, by using Nasty Plot on turn 1 while he goes for Spikes, I'm able to get 1 off to get the plus 2, and then I go for a second since I'm expecting a second layer of Spikes, and sure enough I get them hitting that flamethrower at plus four to KO Klefki, and then doing the same to Metagross, Bisharp, and Doug Trio, following an earthquake that nearly one-shots me, leaving just Magnezone to dispose of. With my illusion worn off though, I can safely swap Zoroark out for the actual Mudsdale to blank a Thunderbolt, using Earthquake after dodging a Screech to bring him down to Sturdy and Healing Range, doing this twice more because he has two full restores, finally KOing after he wastes his one and only attacking move with the Screech that he previously missed. By the way, why have a special attacker with Screech? This thing has Flash Cannon, Thunderbolt, and Tri-Attack, but not Metal Sound instead of Screech? Eh, I gotta love Game Freak, I guess. But with Zorwark at level 59, that's gonna give us a nice little advantage over the rest of the league, considering the cap for entering was 57, but now that we're in, has no level cap. Only excess EXP for Zorwark after sweeping all four teams to have the most edge possible over how in our championship defense. Second up, I chose Acerola, mostly because Zoroark is obviously going to destroy these things regardless of level, so I put Furfru in the back of the party so that Bayonet would never go for Shadow Claw first, instead going for Faint Attack as I go for Nasty Plot, wearing off the illusion and barely taking any damage in the process as she goes for Shadow Claw on Zoroark's Protect turn, and oddly enough, Screech as I use my second Nasty Plot. I figure from here Snarl should be able to do the job. KOing before any more damage can be done to Zorwark, and then doing the same to Frostlass and Delmize back to back with Flamethrower, thank you Fire Weakness. Then of course Palisand and Driftlim both come out and get hit with plus 4 Snarls, each to win the fight in short order. No level up on that fight, but we're close to level 60, and I wouldn't be shocked if we can hit 61 assuming Zorwark is in against all 5 of Olivia and Kahili's Pokemon. Speaking of the former, I chose her in the lineup third, having replaced Snarl with Shadow Ball, but ultimately Shadow Ball for Grass Knot, since that's going to do massive damage against these heavy rock types. She starts with Armaldo as I go with Carbink, setting up Reflect as he attacks with X Scissor, doing the same next turn as I swap into Furfru and set up three charms during the Reflect, allowing for it to elapse, give me a Protect turn, then swap back into Carbink to set up a second one following a Protect, giving me a swap out turn into Zoroark, plus three Protected turns to set up Nasty Plot for the maximum amount of boosts, getting up to plus six and surviving three X Scissors as the Reflect wears off, Protect gets me some leftovers recovery, and I burn Armaldo to a crisp with Flamethrower. Second out is Lycanroc, and I can tell she's trying to hit that Z-move straight away, so I outspeed with Grass Knot to KO, leading to Gigalith, whose Sandstream is going to prevent me from being able to recover at all with leftovers by undoing said recovery for five turns. But by protecting and then using Grass Knot, that burns two out of the five turns that Sandstorm stays up, burning a third as Cradilly comes in fourth and I use Protect once more. Now I go for Flamethrower here, and you might wonder why. I mean, am I in a position that I should swap out? 
Not necessarily. See, I'm expecting Cradilly to go for Rock Tomb, which can't KO even with a critical hit at this point, as the AI is usually programmed to prioritize speed control until they outspeed me. However, even at minus one, Zorwark can't be outsped by either this or Probopass, and heck, that flamethrower even got a burn, so Rock Tomb did even less damage than it would have. But now we can just use Protect to get rid of the last turn of Sandstorm, and now that Cray Dilly's no longer getting the 50% special defense boost from Sandstorm, Flamethrower KOs and leaves just Probopass. Now I know this stupid thing has Sandstorm as well as Thunder Wave, so I'm betting my odds on literally anything not named Sandstorm by using Protect, and sure enough, I'm right as she goes for Thunder Wave, going for Flamethrower and somehow getting the burn on the sturdy Pokemon as Power Gem lands next turn to bring Zoroark down to 12 HP. But we're not gonna have to work through any full restores here as the burn KOs Probopass between turns winning me the fight. Sure, I was risking a few crits here, but I mean, come on, it just was totally worth it to solo this annoying team with such a frail but strong Pokemon. Now then, time for Kahili, and just to change up the pacing here, I decided to make a mini challenge here for myself. I'm not going to allow myself to use Zorwark unless I absolutely am forced to, aka if all five of my other Pokemon get KO'd, just so this has a little bit more of a stake to it. She leads Braviary as I go with Carbink, setting up Reflect as she uses Brave Bird to get a critical, doing around a third as I swap into Furfru and take around 30% from Brave Bird, but now I'm outspeeding and getting up Charm, though that's short-lived as she reciprocates with the scary face, further corroborating my initial theory with the way that the AI treats speed control. But now this makes it so that Braviary can outspeed Furfru. That's all well and dandy though, as we take two air slashes to bring Furfru down to around 33%, as two more charms hit and get them down to minus six, but I'm not quite done here yet. I need to bring Carbink back in to set up Reflect again, as well as Light Screen, to keep this air slash from doing that much damage since I didn't give anybody confide for this fight. Though I think this would be hilarious. After setting up screens, I start going for Power Gem and then just start doing major damage as Braviary gets a Forest Ore after two of them, going down to three more once I set up another layer of screens. We're still at over half HP as Braviary goes down, bringing in Hawlucha, who goes for a Poison Jab for basically no damage, going down to two Moon Blasts afterwards. Out comes Mandibuzz third and Brave Bird does next to nothing, even without Reflect, so it literally is nothing with Reflect up. She does get a little annoying though here, going for Flatter to raise my special attack by two stages and confuse me. Though thank goodness this isn't Swagger, since now Power Gem and Moonblast get a plus two boost, and I don't hit myself with any extra damage because of Confusion, because it goes based on physical attack stat. Once we're free of Confusion though, I'm able to just hit it with one more Moonblast, KOing and leading to her Ace 2 Cannon. I see no world where two cannon gets to go for anything but bullet seed here, so I'm just gonna click power gem to see where this goes, and somehow she's actually stupid and goes for screech, being negated by clear body as power gem brings her into full restore range. That's a healing item taken out of commission, but it's not like that matters too much as two cannon uses its only attacking turn on beak blast, forcing it to attack last, but get KO'd by another power gem before it has the chance to do so, leaving just the fire flying variant of Oricorio to hit Teeter Dance, but we hit through confusion to KO in one shot with power gem to win the fight. That's right, that was a full 5 on 1 carbink sweep. Sure, we had some help with Furfru to lower Braviary's attack, but for the rest of the fight, that was literally all on Carbink's non-existent shoulders, and it managed to bash its face into victory there, it was great. With a few TM changes though, it's time for the final battle. How leads off with a Alolan Raichu as I go with Carbink, and well, you would think that I could just go for Zorwark immediately from the get-go with Mud's tail in the back and just bait Psychic over and over and set up three nasty plots and go to town, but I'd rather be safe about it first and go for the neutering of his special attack stat before just trusting the AI to do something like that because it does have Focus Blast and that would kill Zorwark immediately. This involves taking a Thunderbolt and then setting up Light Screen, then alternating Protecting and Fight, all while repeatedly taking Thunderbolts at the risk of potential paralysis, though sometimes Hao does change it up and go for Psychic instead. Eventually, I just let go of Protect to have some more turns to set up Confide while under Light Screen, getting up to minus six right as the second Light Screen elapses, hitting Moon Blast, and since I'm dumb and was like, oh, I should bait for the attack drop, not realizing that I had mixed up Moon Blast and Play Rough in that exact moment. All good though as he starts using Focus Blast, and that is the move that made me not want to go into Zorwark. 
Thankfully though, once I get Raichu to red HP, it's in full restored territory and I'm good to swap into Zoroark, disguised as Mudsteel without the potential of losing the illusion, setting up three nasty plots all while he wastes turns with Psychic, KOing following those with Shadow Ball. Second is Tauros, goes down to Flamethrower. Third is Vaporeon, falls to Shadow Ball. Fourth is Crepominable, super effective dying to Flamethrower. Fifth is Decidueye, also getting roasted by Flamethrower, leaving just Noivern, who can't really do anything but hit Super Fang into Mudsdale, and I'm perfectly content with that since it can only ever do half damage to the opponent, knocking our illusion away, revealing Zoroark, but making way for Shadow Ball to KO and pick up the clean, clean zero loss victory in the Pokemon League. That's pretty good for an Alola game. Pretty damn good. Especially with only three deaths overall. Not to mention we got to save Poipole, Mincino, Bruxish, Tortuga, Comfy, and Kangaskhan since they never ended up being used in battle. So much for all that time wasted SOS chaining for Kangaskhan. Whoopsie. But with this game finished, we're at 415 Pokemon used. Only 78 more to hit the amount in Generation 4. So let's set a mini goal. I'm going to try my best to get all the way through Generation 8 with 493 or less Pokemon used. If we average this out, that's 78 Pokemon divided by 6 games, so that's only 13 Pokemon for each. That's going to be a tough nut to crack, but let's see if I can pull it off starting in Ultra Moon. So, Ultra Moon's gonna be a quicker one since, oh boy, I'm throwing out the entire artillery's worth of strong Pokemon into this one despite only restricting myself to 13 Pokemon overall. I'd pick Litten again as my starter, even though I can't use it, mostly just to give Howe's team a little less difficulty. And while I don't usually like giving my rival the easy starter, with my new arbitrary restriction, I figured it would be well worth it. Especially when you see two of these encounters here on Melee Melee Island alone. Instead of Litten though, I'll be taking Inkay from Route 1's Howley Outskirts as my Route 1 encounter, managing to get Contrary on it so that'll make a very strong Malamar once we evolve it and get a move like Superpower. Plus, being able to use it against stat dropping moves like Leer will prove super helpful shortly. Despite being slow though, I'll be EV training this in attack and speed since Malamar isn't really the slowest thing in the world and I figure we can outspeed most of the Alolan Pokemon we'll be running into throughout this game. Second up in the trainer school is Alolan Grimer. Yes, we're using another Kanto Pokemon just before Let's Go. And honestly, it doesn't matter all that much since Grimer and Muck are available so late into those games, it's kind of pointless to reserve it, so we'll be using the Alolan variety. This gal is getting Eevee Train in attack, as well as a split between HP and defense, since there's no way I'm pouring speed into something with a base 50 speed. Base 60 is probably the lowest I would go into speed investment for this game, but I digress. With these two in hand though, I do some EV training on Route 1 before taking out the trainer school and heading into Howley City for my third encounter in Scatterbug, using Island Scan on Thursday to do so. While this might be worrying a little bit as this can count as three Pokemon, thankfully the EXP share that we just got will allow me to never send Scatterbug or Spupa into battle while EV training them with the help of Inke and Grimer, getting it to level 12 right at the level cap to evolve into Vivalon and take on Illima. His Young Goose is a bit of a threat using two Leers as I use two bites with Grimer, barely missing the KO as I swap into Vivalon to shake those off while he heals with a potion, putting me back to square one. All good though as I'm able to hit two stun spores, with the first being healed off with a full heal, as well as a few air cutters, getting Young Goose down into the red as I swap back out for Grimer, as I don't want Vivalon getting more EXP than it needs to considering we're so close to the cap. Grimer comes in on a tackle for nearly half as we KO with Bite to follow up, leaving just Smeargle to try battering us with two tackles, but it's barely not enough as two Bites manages to get the KO and win the fight. Perfect, now that Route 2 has been opened up, it's time to get the ultimate Run Annihilator, Spearow. Oh well, we've already used Spearow. See, this is a trade fodder Pokemon, so that we can trade it in the Pokemon Center for a Hawlucha, a fighting and flying type that is super overpowered for this early in the game, being able to use moves like the TM for Brick Break to KO literally everything in the Verdant Cavern Trial, including one-shotting the Totem Raticate to give me the Normalium Z. Of course, it'll be Eevee Train and Attack and Speed, what do you expect? Fun fact, this Pokemon is actually used in speedruns of Ultra Sun and Moon, as the extra EXP gain from being traded as well as the strong moves basically makes it an easy sweep whenever it gets into any fight, especially with X items, though because we are playing a hardcore Nuzlocke, we'll have to resort to Hone Claws for our stat boosts, as if I would ever not use it. 
With the Verdant Cavern trial finished though, we're clear to head through Route 3 and into Melee Melee Meadows, taking out Solyra's Furfru with Halucha before challenging Hal for the technical third time, but those first two fights are literally just fluff. He leads with Rowlet, so I go with Halucha, setting up a few Hone Claws before hitting it with Wing Attack, as well as Noibat, finally finishing off Pikachu with Brick Break to win the fight in short order. And with this team of four all trained up afterwards, I'm ready to take out Kahunahala, and it's no surprise that this is made easy thanks to Halucha. He leads Machop against my Halucha, so I just go for Aerial Ace on turn 1 to 1 shot, leading to Makahita, who has nothing but the resisted arm thrust to hit me with, following the one-time fakeout. From here, I can just set up as many Hone Claws as I need, finishing it and Crabrawler off with one Aerial Ace apiece to win the fight. Well, shoot, <laughs> that was a quick melee melee island. So after some botched Mantine surfing, we're good to go into Akala following the last bit of Eevee training needed for my four current party members. Kicking off the island is the fight against... <laughs> ...who's easily dispatched with Grimer, taking out both Smoochum and Glaceon, letting me enter Route 4 for the most important thing in the game, not an encounter, but instead a singular item, the Adrenaline Orb. With a single one of these in my grasp, I can head back to Melee Melee Islands Route 3, enter the patch of grass south of the bridge, and get hunting. If you're familiar with Ultra Sun and Moon, you know the stupidity I'm about to attempt. With no other encounters in this area that I can use, I'm clear to search for the 1% bag on. Now this is why I brought up Contrary with Leer earlier. Seeing as I can ensure that Bite and Rage don't get out of hand, though Ember's ability to burn is still a problem. Thankfully, Vivalon has access to both Light Screen and Safeguard, so that's covered. Sadly though, during my chain, I do end up over-leveling Vivalon for the Totem Araquanid fight. Though, admittedly, I don't think it'll be mattering whatsoever once I finally manage to encounter the one and only Salamence. That's right, a f 600 base stat total Salamence is available at this low of a level if you're willing to go insane trying to chain for it. For me, I ended up finally finding one really deep into the chain, I think I had KO'd over 30 Bagon trying to find this thing, and because of it, Salamence actually has four perfect IVs rather than being completely random, making it even more powerful than initially thought. Top that off with a nature that increases attack but decreases speed, and we're pretty much in the gold here. Sadly though, that speed decrease is going to be a little bit of a problem down the line, but for now, where I'm still fighting not fully evolved Pokemon, Salamence should be able to tear through them pretty efficiently. Plus, we still have Halucha, so there's definitely nothing to worry about. Heading into Peniola Town it gets me into a battle with Hao, taking out Dartrix with three Dragon Breaths following a Breakneck Blix and a Pluck, doing slightly less than half as my even more broken ability, Moxie Triggers. Yeah, hidden abilities also come on SOS chained Pokemon, giving Salamence even more steamroll potential, KOing Pikachu with Brick Break without triggering static, Noibat with Bite, and Eevee with Brick Break to win the fight. Now that is how you handle a fight without setting up, mostly because the Pokemon sets up for you. Straight after on Route 5 is our first battle with Gladian, also soloable with Salamence thanks to Brick Break on Zerua, Bite on Zubat, and a plus two super effective Brick Break to one-shot Type Null to win the battle. Now, sadly, we can't exactly steamroll the Totem Araquanid in Lana's trial with Salamence, and that's because she knows this thing called uh, Aurora Beam, not exactly something you want to be hit by when you're quad weak to the attack. Thankfully though, Araquanid's special attack is pretty goddamn terrible, so even if we do have to take one of them, it shouldn't KO in one shot barring a critical hit, and even then, I don't think it would. Though, I do have to bring up this string of Dewpiter during the trial that just kept summoning more Dewpiter over and over again, to the point where Salamence was threatened in the rain of all things. I'm glad this didn't go poorly thanks to Moxie eventually just one-shotting them, but boy that was not fun. Anyway, the Totem Araquanid is somewhat easy to take down. Starting Halucha against it and taking a bubble for around half as Aerial Ace brings it into the yellow. But for some reason still spawns the Masquerine ally? I thought it would summon Dewpiter first if it went below half, but I guess not. That means Intimidate screws over my plans of just two-shotting the Araquanid, so I swapped a Grimer to tank some attacks, eventually remaining around a quarter only to hit a Light Poison Fang before swapping again for Salamence, dodging a Stun Spore from Masquerain and taking a Bubble for minimal damage as I use Protect for some healing with leftovers, and then Bite to attempt a KO on Araquanid, but it's a tanky bastard and survives, hitting an Aurora Beam for less than half, all while Masquerain lands a Scary Face. 
Thankfully, after protecting again, Masquerade misses another stun spore and we survive another Aurora Beam, retaliating with Bite to KO with the Araquanid and leave the Masquerade to attempt to fend for itself. The only attacking move this thing has, though, is Bug Bite, so I'm fine with just using Protect and Bite to keep up the pressure of healing and offense, KOing with two bites to win the Water EMZ. That could have gone better, but again, not sure what the heck made Masquerade come out first instead of the Dewbiter. Not long after is a quick battle with Salira and her Poi Pole in Route 5, being defeated by Inkei relatively quickly before we dome our opponents in the Battle Royale and head into Wella Volcano Park for the Fire Trial. Well, almost. Right outside is Route 7, and it has a portion of water that I can surf on to capture myself a Pukumuku. While not an offensive water type for the fire trial, it is fantastic at setting up dual screens and safeguard, while also being able to fire off Toxic once we get access to it by level up, and then of course by TM in the Aether Paradise. For now, we'll have to rock with Bide and Counter, both of which of course do not work on the Totem Alolan Marowak, so that's a bit frustrating, uh, but apparently I only learned that during the fight, uh, but other than that I think I have a pretty decent plan here. First things first, I set up Safeguard to ensure I can't get poisoned by the incoming ally Salazzle, then immediately become an idiot by trying to use Counter on Marowak despite it being a fighting type move. To be completely honest, I thought this would work like a Nightshade or Sand Attack, where despite the move's typing, it still hits Pokémon that are normally immune to it because Game Freak said so, but I guess that's only a selective say-so whenever it's inconvenient for me. Either way, I swap Pukamuku out for Salamence, using Protect then Crunch on Marowak for a little less than half, then Protect and Crunch once more as I continue to be hit with Venishock and Hex for some decent damage, being brought down into the red as I managed to predict the turns where Marowak would use Detect by using Protect myself, eventually getting back into the yellow as Marowak goes down and leaves just Salazzle, who wastes its best chance at KOing one of my Pokémon by using Poison Gas as the safeguard just ran out. Perfect timing though, as now I can swap into Grimer, then alternate Protect and Thief to do some decent damage, KOing after three rotations of these to win the match and the Fire EMZ. Dope. Now what about the Grass Trial? Well, you uh, remember what we did with Cutie Fly and Ultra Sun? Yeah, we're just gonna do that with uh, Vivalon. Just j literally just the exact same moves, and albeit with a stronger Pokemon that can better resist all of Lurantis's moves with the Bug Flying type as opposed to being Bug Fairy. Signal Beam does a massive amount of damage here, doing just a wee bit over half, though on the first turn, getting a critical hit makes me hopeful that I can, you know, end this faster than we could with Cutie Fly, though it still takes all 15 power points of Signal Beam to plow through Lurantis and Comfey combined to win. Uh, floral Healing and Synthesis be damned! It is quite funny looking back at the fights against the Totem Lurantis in the original Sun and Moon in comparison to these two fights in USUM, and just seeing how much I had to struggle with them, whereas here it's spam signal beam to win! But I guess that's what happens when Mantine surfing tutor moves exist. But with our three trials finished, all that's left are Plumeria and Olivia to finish out Akala Island. After making it to Kanikani City and heading out towards the Akala outskirts, we're ready to battle Plumeria as she leads Golbat and myself with Salamence, taking a Confuse Ray before hitting Aerial Ace for over half, with no Confusion Chance required thanks to a held Person Berry. Since she's dumb and doesn't go for it again, however, only doing about a quarter damage before going down to a second Aerial Ace. So now all I have to get through is a Salandit, which should be an easy outspeed and... Yep, that's the negative speed nature coming to try and screw me over as early as humanly possible. Yep. Thankfully, all Salandit can do here is poison me as I hit a quad effective Bulldoze to win the fight, but the fact that an unevolved Salandit can outspeed the top tier Hoenn Pseudo Legendary is quite frustrating in a way that you would only experience from having it happen to you when you just expect to kill the damn thing. Anyway, Olivia's straight after, and this is probably where our first true setup sweep is to be done, as I'm able to set up Reflect with Pukamuku before swapping out into Halucha, setting up six Hone Claws to max out my attack and KO Anorith, Lilip, and Lycanroc all with one flying press apiece to win the fight. Yeah, I probably should have kept Brick Break instead, just in case, since that move being both fighting and flying, that being flying press, was making it so that I couldn't hit anything for super effective damage because you know, dual-type moves are weird, but hey, I won, who gives a I sure don't, but what I do give a shit about is being able to kill the tentacle hentai monster over on the Aether Paradise so I can make my way onto Ula Ula Island. Halfway through the last Alola game, I'm so close I can almost taste something that isn't tropical for the first time in god knows how long. 
With our first steps on the island, it's time for another battle against Howe, leading Jartrix as I lead Salamence, going straight for Aerial Ace for a KO and a Moxie boost, doing the same to a Lolan Raichu after taking a Psychic for less than half, KOing and getting a second attack boost thanks to Crunch and Moxie as Tauros enters third, nullifying it with Intimidate. No problem though, as I can use Protect, blocking Horn Attack, and then take one next turn for around a quarter damage as the newly learned Dragon Claw gets a one-shot, KOing and giving back that attack boost that was wrongfully stolen from me. Anyway, fourth out is Noibat, an easy Protect and Dragon Claw KO, leaving just Vaporeon, who has the same thing happen to it. Protect and Dragon Claw alternate to KO, and win me the fight with the solo Salamence sweep. Not bad if I do say so myself. Now up to Mount Hokulani to take on the Electric Trial and Totem Togemaru. Now, I don't really have the best ground type attacks for this, but thankfully I do have Bulldoze on Salamence and Brick Break as well on, like, both Salamence and Grimer? It should be good enough. Both are super effective and should hopefully do the job. Firstly, I used Salamence to try to get some damage off on Togedomaru before the ally was summoned, but of course it goes for Spiky Shield beforehand, nullifying my Bulldoze before calling on the ally Skarmory. At least this isn't threatening damage-wise, as I'm able to alternate Protect and Bulldoze, managing to hit three of them before being brought down to the red with a mix of Zing Zap and Steel Wing. But now that I've hit it with three bulldozers, I'm now faster than Togedomaru, which means I can just go for the bulldoze again, outspeeding it, but still having to take Steel Wing from Skarmory, dropping to just 7 HP as the totem gets KO'd. But that's fine, because I can just protect, swap out into Pukumuku, and use Bide to attempt to fire back at it. Though this is not the fastest strategy in the world, as it takes barely any damage whatsoever. I try this, not once, not twice, up three times, but eventually the fourth and final bide is able to KO the Skarmory and win me the fight. And I'm just gonna say, the fact that Pukabuku was able to KO a single Pokemon with something not named Toxic is absolutely hilarious, but will likely not happen again. But with this trial taken down, it's back to the Mally Garden we go for our last, first fight against Guzma. That makes sense. He leads with Galissapod, so I use Halusha, using Hone Claws turn 1 as he goes for Razor Shell for about 75% damage, then I alternate Protect and Aerial Ace to drop it below half and send it out with Emergency Exit, leaving Masquerade to take its place. At least here, I am able to swap out for Pukamuku, set up screens, then go into Salamence to take it out with an Aerial Ace, getting a Moxie Boost, then Protect against a potential first impression on Galissapod and KO with a follow-up Aerial Ace to win the fight. A little sloppy, but when you have a Salamence and a Lucha, sometimes you just let your guard down and expect the A button to do all the work instead of your brain. Sadly though, we're coming up on the next Totem Pokemon, as we're faced with Mimikyu after heading through routes 12 and 13 into Tapu Village. And this is not a Pokemon where I can expect the A button to do all the work, I have to use my brain. In fact, I accidentally tried to use the A button and preemptively entered the trial since I thought I could get away with using the party for it, but after beating the Gengar in there, I knew there was no chance I'd be able to survive this fight without any way to lower Mimikyu's attack stat or break the disguise without sacrificing a Pokemon. So it's back to the encounter well we go to grab three new Pokemon to gain the advantage. Firstly, on edge over in the Akala outskirts, using Island Scan on a Wednesday for it. Secondly, I grabbed more lull from Brooklet Hill during the night. And finally, Dedenne from Blush Mountain. Now, while this might seem like it would send us over the 13 number that we need to keep averaged out to get through all of Gen 8 with less than or equal to 493 Pokemon used, I'm actually able to bypass using more lull once again thanks to the EXP shared, using Dedenne to do so. Though I can't quite do that with On Edge due to it evolving right at the cap of 35. With those additions though, replacing Salamence, Halucha, and Malamar, I should have an easy enough time taking this thing out, even if I lose a Pokemon like Dedenne, since I don't anticipate it using it very much. Speaking of which though, I start with Dedenne against the Totem Mimikyu, taking a play rough for around 80% before hitting it with a Volt Switch to get rid of the Disguise, swapping it out for Shenotic on the entrance of Bayonet. This is all good though, since even through Play Rough and Curse, I'm able to use the move Strength Sap, lowering Mimikyu's attack and gaining back HP by the amount it decreased. And since that attack stat is massive, that's a great thing for Shenotic, as I'm able to just recover back all of that HP. Hilariously too, Effect Spore triggers here on Mimikyu, poisoning it, and therefore burning up the held Lumberry to make way for potential Sleep Powder usage later on in the battle. With Bayonet using Screech though, I know it's time to swap out for another Pokemon here, that being Mimikyu so that I can set up Reflect, getting burned with Will-O-Wisp in the process of dodging a Play Rough. 
All good though is I'm able to set this up, then swap into Vivalon to heal off that burn with aromatherapy before seeing Bayonet KO itself with Curse. Well then, I guess this is a good opportunity to go one-on-one -on -one with Shenotic and finish off its attack stat for good while it's still at high enough HP to not summon Jellison. So I go back into Pukumuku to set up screens once again before going back into Shenotic, unfortunately hitting off the effect spore again and poisoning it. So I'm just going as much strength sap over and over again before the inevitable Jellison enters the field. And of course, during this I end up seeing a critical leech life, making it so that Mimikyu will be sticking around for just a few more turns. I should be able to KO the Jellicent in time to make this easy once again though, but of course, after a single Giga Drain barely misses the KO, bringing it down into the red, Cursed Body triggers and means I won't be able to use the attack again for several turns. Not to be denied though, as I just alternate Moonlight and Sleep Powder on Jellicent, though admittedly, spite getting rid of all of Moonlight's power points after just one usage is really annoying, but should be enough for me to get out of Curse Body once I use a Strength Sap on Mimikyu, and sure enough, now that it's at minus six, Curse Body alleviates, Giga Drain KOs Jellicent, and Mimikyu falls to poison damage, winning me the fight. Not bad at all. Heck, I probably could have forgone to Dene and just used Vivalon and U-Turn to get rid of the disguise instead, but I'm fine with the outcome here. And even funnier, I could have just left Onage behind and not worried about evolving it until the level cap soared up to 44 here for Nanu, but just as long as I don't need to use another Pokemon, I am at the perfect 13 with Aegislash, so I can't be too mad. Right after is another battle with Plumeria over at the Aether House, thankfully with Golbat handled by Dedene and Dewblade, using Charge Beam with the former and two Shadow Sneaks from the latter, leading to Salazzle. Not a problem, as a single swap out into Salamence tanking Flamethrower, then taking a Dragon Pulse, leaving just 6 HP to nearly KO with Dragon Claw, so we go out to our newly evolved Muck to KO with Crunch to win the fight. Well, that was again sloppy, probably should have predicted the Dragon Pulse with Salazzle, but admittedly I didn't look at the moveset ahead of this fight, and forgot she had access to this move. Glad it didn't cost me one of the best party members I have access to, I am a dumb mother <laughs> But with her defeated, we're clear to move through routes 15 to 17, entering Po Town for another showdown against Guzma. Well, more like another flattening to be completely fair, as he leads with Galissapod and myself Pukumuku. Setting up Reflect, then sending in Hawlucha to do some good Lucha things, setting up Hone Claws twice, then using Fly to KO it and Masquerade before Pinsir comes in. Basically, unable to do anything as I just outpace its damage with Roost, setting up a few more Hone Claws before finally KOing with Fly to win the fight. Sorry, bud. Third time's the charm, right? Well, I sure hope not, but with him defeated, I'm clear to go back to the Aether House where Gladian is mad. But it's a good thing my team's extremely powerful, making him pitiful and sad. Golbat's his lead and Dewblade's able to counteract with Autotomize, making sure we outspeed, though admittedly it doesn't really matter much when our move of choice is Shadow Sneak. Hilariously though, he swaps into Type Null, but it's not actually Type Null seeing as it's level 42 and so very clearly Zorark, breaking the illusion and then making him swap again as I swap on the same turn into Salamence, hitting two Dragon Claws through a Crush Claw to KO and get the Moxie boost, then alternate it and Protect to KO both Zorark and Golbat to win the fight. Very pitiful and sad indeed. But with him defeated, all that remains on the island is Nanu, who should be pretty damn easy due to the power of Shenotic, Vivalon, and Halucha all on our one team. First out is Sableye, so I'm going with Pukamuku, taking a fake out on the first turn before flinching and setting up a protect and light screen. Swapping into Halucha next turn in the attempt to set up Hone Claws, admittedly gets destroyed by two Shadow Balls in a row that managed to get special defense drops, so that's gonna make me lose the fight if I don't decide to reset the clock here by doing some stalling with swapping between Halucha and Pukamuku. Resetting the light screen twice and draining all of Sableye's power points of Shadow Ball, leaving her with only Power Gem, a move that I resist on turns where I use Halucha's Roost, leaving it to set up all six Hone Claws needed to max out the attack and accuracy necessary to KO Sableye with Fly, Persian following a fake out and Power Gem with High Jump Kick, and Krokorok also with High Jump Kick to win the fight. Admittedly, this is exactly why I've kept Hone Claws around. Why get rid of it when I can boost the accuracy of Fly, a 95% accurate move, and High Jump Kick, a 90% accurate move, to 100% while also having vastly superior power compared to something like Aerial Ace and Brick Break? Basically, just giving more punch behind my... kicks. Yeah, that makes sense. On to Aether Paradise! 
well, almost. I gotta grab that desk zone from Mali City now that the fight with Nanu has concluded, as well as teaching Aegislash both Iron Head and Shadow Claw to better take advantage of its stab typings. Unfortunately, though, Aegislash doesn't learn King's Shield on Evolution, so we won't be able to swap between the Shield and Blade form until we relearn it, which is right on Mount Lanakila before the Elite Four. So... Whoops, but I think that now we should be able to hit fast and hard thanks to Autotomize and a mix of Shadow Claw and Iron Head. Now it's time to turn this hellscape into an actual paradise by killing the man who has brought nasty bugs to the area, that being the last fight against Guzma. He leads once again with Galisopod, Galisopod, whatever you want to call it, so stop me if you've seen this before. Well, this time it's a mix of strategies that I used against him as well as against the Totem Mimikyu, using Shinotic to resist Razor Shell all while stealing the HP needed to keep healthy through his assault, finally ending on the newly learned Spore to put it to sleep and alleviate Halucha's damage burden on his way to plus 6 attacking accuracy, using... Five hone claws because this bastard decided to get like three defense drops in a row. Asshole! Now die. Fly to Glycopod, fly to Vikavolt, fly to Masquerain, fly to Pinsir. Good. Now never do that again. Speaking of never doing that again, Solyra decides to fight me for the last time with Poipol, wasting a turn on an X special defense as two of Aegislash's Shadow Claw puts her down, putting me in line to fight Lusamine. Thankfully, she's not hard whatsoever. Though what was hard was finding the footage of this fight. See, I record these in multiple chunks so that my editor doesn't have to work through the entire game's worth of gameplay footage to get to the parts where I talk about them in the videos themselves. But that means when I go to render out each individual chunk like I did with this video, I decided to put all of those clips into each island. Sometimes I accidentally delete a piece of footage here and there, and this just so happens to be one of them. Thankfully for memory, I can tell you that I just used Pukamuku's light screen and confide to neuter Clefable special attack, then brought in Halucha to set up a whole bunch of home claws to max out the attack and accuracy, as well as Roost to keep healthy enough seeing as the only Pokemon on Lusamine's team to outspeed is Lopunny, which could theoretically hit me with a Thunder Punch that could do a lot of damage if I wasn't near max HP. With Roost, though, that wasn't a problem, as I was able to KO her Clefable and Beware with Fly, Lopunny and Milotic with High Jump Kick, and Lilligant with Fly as well to win the fight. Simple as that, and now we're on Pony Island with the TM for Toxic in hand. Good timing, too, since we're probably gonna want that for both totems on this island, as well as Ultra Necrozma. Speaking of which, oh lord, I am friggin' scared about that fight due to not having Zorwark, and I wouldn't be shocked if our attempt at using 493 or less Pokemon by the end of Gen 8 is cut down due to that absolute behemoth. Oh, and I forgot that I was wrong about Salira and Poipil since she does battle you one more time before the Gauntlet of Vaspony Canyon. Thankfully, I'm able to get through that no problem. The trainers are kind of difficult, but I've gotten pretty damn good at getting around all of the optional ones with four runs of Alola back to back like this. Maybe I should consider speedrunning. No, no, I'm just gonna cut that thought off right there. There is zero chance I want to speedrun Alola considering how bored I get with all the cutscenes and whatnot. Anyway, the totem fight against Komoo ends up going pretty well, considering that Pukamuku is able to hit Toxic on it, all while I stall it out with the bulk of Pukamuku, Aegislash, and Muk all equipped with Protect, KOing it and leaving just the ally Noivern to try to stand up against me, but by also having Toxic on Muk, I'm able to hit Noivern with it just as well and alternate between it and Aegislash to KO and win the fight. Gotta say, no Lumberry on anything but Mimikyu makes these fights a breeze. Now it's time for the Necrozma duo. Dawnwing's Necrozma is at least decently easy to handle thanks to Muck. Using Toxic and stalling it out as the best move it has against me is Power Gem. Then I'm able to fire back with Quad Effective Crunch due to it being Psychic and Ghost type to end the fight much faster before heading through Ultra Space to fight Ultra Necrozma. Thankfully, Pukamuku's insane bulk is somehow enough to survive on like so few hit points that they're on one hand. I, I don't understand how this stupid little Water Dwayne here, Water Dwayne the Rock Johnson here, is able to survive a Photon Geyser and then hit Toxic, ensuring I have a clock so that I can't possibly lose this run here. I am able to use Protect against the second Photon Geyser, then swap into Muck for the Dark-type immunity, using Protect once more to get it to only two more turns of Toxic before it goes down, and from here I'm expecting Dragon Pulse, so I go into Aegislash to resist it, finally using Protect to outlast the Toxic Poison to KO and win the fight. 
Who knew that the key to winning this fight was going to be a stupid little gimmicky pukabuku? It is an absolute gremlin, and thank it very much for making sure I got through this game. But with most of the story out of the way, all we have left is Mina's Trial and Hapu's Grand Trial. While I spent time going over all of the fights in Mina's Trial in Ultra Sun, I think you guys kinda get it by now. A physically attacking team is going to get walled by Shinotic Strength Sap and swept by either Halucha, Aegislash, or in Mina's case, Vivalon now that I have access to Quiver Dance. Though, admittedly, that Quiver Dance is short-lived as after I'm able to take out Mina's Grand Bull, Ribombi, and Mawile, Vivalon's unfortunately cut down by Illima, giving me my first Death of Ultramoon. Kind of surprised it took this long to happen, but I wasn't intending on bringing it into the League, so I'm not too disappointed by it. Plus, it was bound to happen eventually. Setup sweeps are pretty susceptible to critical hits, especially against an opponent who has the ability to always hit for half damage in the case of Super Fang. Thankfully, Halucha cleans up that fight. Muck handles almost the entirety of Lana's team except for Araquanid, which is KO'd by Salamence. Gaoi's team is pretty threatening thanks to Flare Blitz on Arcanine, but thanks to Pukumuku, I'm able to stand up well enough with Salamence using Moxie to clear through Arcanine, Talonflame, and Alolan Marowak, as well as the follow-up Hiker. Then Nanu's pretty easy to rip through with Halucha, leaving just the Totem Rabambi. Fortunately here, I'm able to use Pukumuku to hit back-to-back -to -back Toxics on both Rabambi, using Quiver Dance that turn, and the ally Pelipper, getting hit with Rabambi's Bug Buzz while Pelipper wastes a turn with Stockpile. From here, though, it's just survival, a pretty easy feat thanks to Protect and swapping in Pokémon that resist attacks, like with Aegislash against Bug Buzz and Seed Bomb, then into Muck to attempt to predict Dazzling Gleam, but instead of seeing that, we just get another Quiver Dance on the last turn it has potentially living, and then Scald from Pelipper before Rabombi gets KO'd, leaving just one more turn on Pelipper, outlasted by Muck's Protect, to KO and win the last totem fight of this series. One trip to Executor Island later, and it's time for our last Grand Trial, leading Shinotic against Hapu's Golurk, and just doing the same thing we've done multiple times before. I leave with Strength Sap, anticipating a Stealth Rock, then using Spore on the first turn as she goes for a Shadow Punch, getting a few more Strength Saps off before she wakes up, and affect Spore triggers on one of the Shadow Punches, paralyzing Golurk and getting the full paralysis on the sixth and final Strength Sap so that Shinotic ends up at full HP before I swap into Malamar. See, I'm stupid and forget this thing is a ghost type, so I was going to try to superpower sweep to show that Malamar was not a waste of a Pokemon for me, but I can't, so I just go into Halucha, which was probably the right move to begin with. Six own claws is enough for me to get to max attack and accuracy, using Fly to try to avoid an attack and get an extra turn of Leftovers recovery, uh, but I forgot that No Guard is able to hit through semi-invulnerable turns of moves like Fly or Dive, so whoopsie. Anyway, it goes down and out comes Gastrodon, falling to High Jump Kick, as do Flygon and Mudsdale to win me the last trial, and Z-Crystal of the run. Wave goodbye to all the Z-Crystals, friendos. You'll never have to see them again. Until I eventually finish the Professor Oak's challenge of these games. F*** Poke Palago. But with that, it's Mount Lanakila time. Of course, first things first, here is our final battle against Gladian. And honestly, this is such an easy sweep that it's not even funny. I lead Pukimuku to set up Reflect, then swap into Aegislash on his Crobat since it just walls this thing entirely. I am able to KO it with two Shadow Claws through two Acrobatics as Lucario enters second, but I know better. This is totally Zoroark, so I swap into Muk, and sure enough, here comes the Black Hole Eclipse. Being resisted rather well by Muk for around half before I start alternating Confide and Protect to lower his special attack, nullifying Night Days, Hyper Voice, and Grass Knot all before bringing in Halucha to set up not just six, but eight uses of Hone Claws to ensure that Night Days' accuracy decreases don't become a problem, KOing Zoroark, Lucario, and Silvali all with one single high jump kick apiece to win the fight. But we're not out of the woods yet. See, because of the increased EXP gain of Halucha due to being a traded Pokemon, there's one required battle in this game's victory road that is very, very difficult without him, and that's this double battle against this Master and Apprentice. One side uses Vicavolt and Fortress, while the other has Glalie, Tyranitar, and Bisharp. That right side with the latter Pokemon would be super easy to take down with a barrage of high jump kicks, but even from level 56, being in battle against all five of those Pokemon would push Halucha to level 58, which is over the league's level cap. So I'm better off just using a rotation of Pukamuku, Salamence, and Muk to get through, thankfully without another loss to my name. 
That's the last pair of required trainers as well needed to get through Mount Lanakila, so one trip to the move relearner later and I'm good to enter after edging up to the borderline of level 57 and 58. I'm going in with the exact team I've been using for a while now, that being Aegislash, Salamence, Pukamuku, Halucha, Shenotic, and Alolan Muk. Drop a comment down below guessing on whether or not I'll have any losses during this league and how many I will have. I don't anticipate losing this league unless I get just totally boned and all of my sweepers die to critical hits, but surely that won't happen, right? First up is Olivia, leading Armaldo as I go with Pukamuku, using Reflect and Recover to attempt to stall this thing out since there's no way I'm bringing in Shenotic to use Strength Sap against something that has a super effective Excisor. She's got two other attacks, so it's not like she'll run out of power points, so all I need to do is just sit here and waste time with Reflect, Recover, and Protect, eventually seeing her swap moves from Excisor to Crush Claw, which does have the chance to lower defense, but it won't matter as long as I'm recovering HP because of Strength Sap. She also has Rock Blast, which manages to hit Shenotic five times on Switch in as well as a Crush Claw before Strength Sap's able to recover all that HP back. But of course, we have to have Effect Spore go off and poison Armaldo. Thankfully though, this might actually be a good thing because Olivia has a full restore and that gives me an opening to send in Halucha, use as many Home Claws as I can get away with under the poison damage, that being three before she goes into the red, using Roost that turn to heal while she heals, then going for High Jump Kick to KO as I hit full HP off of Leftovers. Second out is Gigalith, a one-shot with high jump kick, as is Lycanroc, leading to Probopass fourth. Sadly, this thing is sturdy, and of course it goes for Thunder Wave afterwards, being healed by a full restore as Halucha is held down by full paralysis. Thankfully, this thing can't get hit too hard because Probopass is just not that strong, so I stay in and try to keep going for high jump kick, hitting it again next turn as Power Gem hits for around 40% and the Sandstorm ends, KOing next turn and leaving just Cradilly to be outsped despite Paralysis, KOing by high jump kick just as well to end the fight. Not bad at all, one down, four to go. However, this next one is probably the last easy member of the league, because Ace Rolla, with the advanced moveset that I've given Aegislash, having the entirety of the moveset replaced by King's Shield, Sacred Sword, Shadow Sneak, and Sword Stance, is pretty much able to sweep this entire team, but I have to do some setup to get there. Of course, Pukamuku's here to set up Reflect against her lead Bayonet, then then Shinotic comes in to start using Strength Sap, obviously triggering Effect Spore on the first attack landing to Poison Bayonet. At least this means that I can get it to be full restored on the turn that I use Spore. Only to run headfirst into the tunnel painted on the wall as Insomnia is the ability. God, I cannot read to save my life. All good though as I can swap back for Pukamuku, set up one more Reflect, then go for Aegislash to use Sword Stance three times, all while taking a critical Shadow Claw and barely surviving as we use Shadow Sneak to KO at plus six. And since nothing else on this team has a priority move aside from Frostlass's Ice Shard, I'm just able to protect with the King's Shield and alternate between that and Shadow Sneak to recover enough HP just in case that does end up hitting hard. Eventually getting back to over half as all of her Pokemon but Drifblim are gone, Drifblim comes in and is KO'd by Shadow Sneak, allowing me to survive the Aftermath ability and win the fight. See why I said that was the last easy fight? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to get away with a simple sweep with either Kahili or Molane, sadly. Especially the latter, considering that nasty prankster Klefki that he has. Anyway, I'm going with Kahili third, leading with Salamence against Braviary in the hopes to eliminate this thing quickly before it comes a problem because Brave Bird hurts. Though admittedly, misclicking Fire Fang on the first turn isn't going to help much. Except it does by getting a burn and making Brave Bird do far less damage than it would have otherwise. Thank you, game, for making my stupidity look smart. I'm eventually able to KO following two uses of Thunderfang to get a Moxie boost as Mandibuzz enters second, immediately going for Flatter to take advantage of that attack boost and reflect it back on me with confusion. Thankfully, that doesn't work on the first turn as Stone Edge nearly KOs Mandibuzz in one shot. This wastes a full restore on Kahili's part, but of course Salamence can't keep up the pressure as she hits herself in confusion, forcing me to swap into Pukamuku to set up Reflect against this physically attacking Buzzard. Once I do so, I can swap out into Muck since I've been hit with Flatter, getting it in and hitting a Rock Slide for around a third as Brave Bird keeps hitting for decent damage, though I swap over to using Gunk Shot next turn and do even more damage, even getting the poison that brings Mandibuzz down into the red healing range, leading to a second full restore of the match. I'm pretty sure that means Kahili's out of them as Muck hits itself in confusion because of Flatter, though also missing Gunk Shot next turn as we get out of confusion hurts. Especially when we're hit by another follow-up flatter, the turn I use Protect. 
At least at this point, I'm simply trying to outlast here, but of course, Muck hitting herself in confusion and then with Brave Bird on the same turn means that we go down to red HP. And I can't stay in, so back out into Pukamuku I go to set up Reflect as I bring in Shenotic afterwards in the attempt to get this thing to go away. I'm able to survive two Brave Birds on red HP, getting off Spore in the process before finally swapping into Hawlucha, setting up a single Hone Claws, all while Mandibuzz stays asleep, then hitting Rock Slide to KO it, two Ganon and Oracorio all before running into the Mirror Match, where Rock Slide does half as we're threatened by a two-hit KO with Flying Press. This is all fine and dandy, but I should be able to seal the deal after bringing back in Pukamuku, then using a mix of Reflect, Recover, and Toxic Damage to KO, though admittedly, her having a full heal was not expected during this. I do eventually manage to get another Toxic off with this one sticking and taking out Halucha after three turns to win me the fight. Alright, that was the medium difficulty one. Now to take on the hardest fight in this entire league with Molane. This stupid Klefki and that damn sturdy Magnazone are the two obstacles standing between me and mashing the A button on setup moves, so I guess I'm gonna have to think today. After swapping around some moves with my TM collection, we're about as good to go as we can possibly be. He leads with Klefki as I go with Pukamuku, reciprocating his Reflect with my own light screen, then using Safeguard as he goes for Spikes. Unfortunately, I don't have access to Rapid Spin, so there's no way to clear this obstacle, but thankfully I'm able to bring in Muck and just start nailing it with a mix of Brick Break to break Reflect and Fire Punch for super effective damage, forcing a full restore before I bring Pukamuku back in to set up another light screen and Safeguard, finally bringing back in Muck to KO with two Fire Punches after taking Spikes damage and three Flash Cannons surviving at around 40% HP as Doug Trio enters second. Of course, Earthquake is what the doctor recommends here, but we're able to just swap for Salamence to dodge it, taking an Iron Head for around half damage and KOing with Firefang on the crackback to get the Moxie boost, though Tangling Hair does slow Salamence down by one stage. Thankfully, we're still faster than basically the entirety of Molane's team, even Magnazone, who ends up going down to two Bulldozes following a Thunderbolt that brings Salamence down into the red, leading to Metagross. It's the battle of Gen 3 pseudo-legendaries, and oddly enough, the battle against the two first Pokémon you see in Pokémon XD Gale of Darkness. But I'm at a massive disadvantage, using Protect to get some more HP back. But realizing I'm not gonna need Salamence for the final fight, I decide to go for Fire Fang in the attempt to one-shot KO at plus two. But it's not enough, leaving it into the red as Meteor Mash KOs Salamence, letting me pick up the Revenge KO with Aegislash's super effective Shadow Sneak, leaving just Bisharp. This sucks, uh, Salamence is really cool, but hey, at least I'm going to be able to make it through this fight, I think. I figure here I'll be able to nullify this thing instantly with King's Shield, lowering his attack by two stages after he makes contact, but of course, I don't know what the Defiant ability does, and it just puts his attack back up two stages to normal. Well, that's horse shit. I still have to think. F*** you, game. I swap back into Pukamuku, only to realize that I don't have Reflect this time around. But hey, at least I'm able to stall out with Protect and Recover in the hopes to drain out these power points. But really, I don't think that's the wisest move. I can at least bring Halucha in on a guaranteed Night Slash, and realizing that I'm faster, just fire off a Hail Mary High Jump Kick, thankfully not missing to KO and win the match. Well shoot, one loss before the champion's a little rough, especially when they have six Pokemon, but as long as I can two for one exchange at least one of Howe's Pokemon, I should be able to still win with one Pokemon left standing. After all, it's the last fight, I'm willing to sacrifice all but one of them if it guarantees victory. But I think I can get away with not having to sacrifice anything if all goes to plan. Now let's see if I can finally pull away from the Alola region with the final battle against Tao, leading Halolan Raichu as I go with Muck, giving it confide for this fight so that I can alternate it and protect, all while Raichu spams Thunderbolt in the attempt to do enough damage to Muck. It's just not gonna work unless he gets like two critical hits in a row, as confide and protect start outpacing his damage with leftovers recovery, getting him to around minus four before he shifts to quick attack as it starts doing more damage. Uh, unfortunate, but fine considering I'm bringing in Pukamuku second to set up light screen again, all before swapping into Halucha to set up the sweep with Hone Claws, taking a Thunderbolt on switch in for minimal damage before he hops over to using Psychic, outspeeding and get getting a critical hit. Well, sh Okay, bye-bye, Halucha, I guess. This is why Aegislash Slash has Sword Stance, because we need a backup just in case something stupid happens. Thankfully, I'm able to evade critical hits and paralysis from Thunderbolt, setting up three Sword Stances, all while Thunderbolt can't even do enough damage to outpace one turn of Leftovers until Light Screen wears off, letting me use Shadow Sneak and get back to full HP as Tauros enters second. 
He tries to use the Intimidate ability to stem the bleeding, but unfortunately for him, I'm able to use King's Shield in the attempt to lower his attack, but due to his attack of choice being Earthquake, no contact is made and no attack is lowered. From here, I'm forced to choose Sacred Sword and just take an Earthquake point-blank next turn for a bit over half, but thanks to it still being in shield form, Aegislash is more than capable of doing so, firing back with Sacred Sword to KO as Noivern is third, getting blocked by King's Shield before being down by Shadow Sneak. Fourth is Decidueye, and I'm not risking any Z-move shenanigans, so I go straight for the Shadow Sneak to super effectively KO as Vaporeon enters fifth, being walled again by King Shield and knocked out by Shadow Sneak just as all of his friends did, leaving just Probominable. Now, I don't think Shadow Sneak would actually KO here, so instead, I decide to use King Shield to lower his attack by two stages as the ability Iron Fist increases the power of punching moves by 20%, all of which are the moves that Crabominable has. Admittedly,